I don't know what it says about us that they're playing Anarchy in the UK. Um, it's maybe the hotel bar last night. So, if we can get our slides up, we're good to go. There we go, look at that. Is everybody awake after the party? Everybody enjoy themselves? Great. Mm -hmm. Well, as we were introduced, uh, this is Nicholas. And sorry, I am. Sorry, this is Chris. I have My to apologies. kind of nudge him to introduce me. Um, thanks very much to the DrupalCon people for inviting us, particularly Isabel and Annie, and also Heather from Acrea. We appreciate it. Um, and hello to the folks from Northern Ireland. Do we have anybody from Belfast here? Awesome. Two people. Yeah, OK. Take over, and I will throw these patches. OK, go. go. Oh. Nobody so, died. OK. If you're enjoying this, uh, follow us at Standard Easters. And if you use the hashtag DrupalCon keynote, uh, you can ask us questions. And also, we can answer questions afterwards. And we'll, also, we'll probably be in a bar as well at some point, because we are from Belfast. We're not actually from Belfast, but we live there. So they forced us to drink. Um, if, if you're, you're really, really enjoying this, I was going to do this one. If you're really you enjoying this, I'm going to have to turn around a little bit and read this. Uh, the hashtag is standardistas, totally awesome Drupal called con keynote. I should have practiced that. Uh, if you use that hashtag, there might be a little badge for you later. Or a wooden business card. Perhaps. Holy Drupal, we hope you all survived your close encounter with Batman last night and aren't feeling too fragile. So the standardistas approach, we, we, we like to kind of give things out and encourage some audience participation. So we have got some badges that we throw at you. And books as well. We, we maybe don't won't throw, throw the, the book because um, it might injure you. Um, when we throw this stuff, if it hits you in the eye and takes out your eye, that's entirely your fault because you're participating in this game show thing that we're running. So what we'll be covering today, first of all, uh, we're going to start off by surveying the landscape that we're in, that we find ourselves in at the moment. And then we're going to reveal, and this is the exciting part, the secret formula. And that's a trademark thing. So don't don't take that from us. Uh, the markup and the sign timelines is the next thing we're going through. And then we're closing on a marriage made in heaven. And it will become clear as we go along. So because we're lecturers, so we teach this kind of stuff, and we're very focused on standards, um, we always like to introduce some books that form the backbone of the talk that we do. Um, so we would highly recommend these three books, which kind of tie together very neatly around what we're talking about today. Uh, if you haven't read Jeremy Keith's HTML5 for web designers, we'd recommend it very highly. Um, in fact, all of the books that A Book Apart are publishing are fantastic. Um, and if you haven't got Ethan Marcotte's Responsive Design, buy it now. And somebody tweet that and say, A Book Apart, those guys are promoting your stuff, because uh, then they might give us more free stuff. Here's another great book. This one is a much weightier tune than uh, the HTML5 for web designers. It's Joseph Miller Brockman's Grid Systems, and uh, we're going to come back to that shortly as well. Weighty, weighty tomb or tome. a weighty tome? Yeah, I can never say that word. A weighty tome and a weighty tomb. Um, finally, Koi Vin's excellent ordering disorder, which really ties those two things together. It ties together the markup side of things and then the fundamental t uh, design principles grid systems side of things. So we're going to talk about designing the sustainable web. A lot of what we're talking about today, in some respects, echoes what Tom Standage was saying yesterday, which is about learning from the past and looking to the past for inspiration as we map our way to the future. Um, although we don't go far as back as the Greeks and the Romans. So surveying the landscape. Um, it's a landscape that's undergoing a very rapid uh, and quite fundamental uh, series of changes. And it's changes to affect how we build what we build and how we design what we design. And one of the big changes over the last sort of couple of years is the proliferation of devices. We're now kind of, you know, we're no longer just consuming the interwebs on a computer at our desk. Uh, and uh, this kind of change is really, it's, it's something that's kind of, uh, it, it brings forward to start really the sort of stuff that we should have been thinking about all along, that we should be designing stuff for any platform, for any device. When we started back in the day and were children, um, there were just desktops. Uh, that's how we designed for the web. And it was great because we could just focus on this one thing. And then there were also Palm VXs. Did anybody have a Palm VX? 
Hey, oh, yeah, there's somebody there. Awesome. That's definitely worth it. Here, there was one over here. I'm going to throw a badge. Um, but now that landscape has changed. So we have phones. We have iPads or tablets. Touch pads, anybody? 89 pounds. Get them this weekend in Dixon's. We've got desktops. We have netbooks and, and laptops. And we also still have those old phones that my wife really likes. She still loves that old phone. Try to persuade her to buy a new one, but she's, she's not into it. And when we bring that together, that becomes a very difficult landscape for designing to, to deliver our content to the web. And it poses a number of challenges. So the context that we're consuming the web is also changing. It used to be that you, could have, you had kind of a, a connection to the internet. It was faster, it was slow, but what we're seeing in the last couple of years is that uh, you're consuming the web just kind of really anywhere. You're no longer just at a desk. You're kind of standing at the bus waiting for um, a bus. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, one would be waiting for a bus if they were standing waiting yes. for a bus. Um, so we consume the web on uh, desktops, um, and that's, that, that's a type of content that we tend to go deeper into. Maybe we sit down and read longer. Um, but we also consume the web when we're out and about. And that, that requires us to think about what we deliver to people uh, because they're in a different context, and the kind of stuff that you're delivering to them needs to shift slightly. And one of the main things that we need to think about it, uh, in, that, in that regard is not just kind of screen sizes and so forth, but it's also kind of a bandwidth issue. How fast is your connection if you're out kind of anywhere in Croydon? It's going to be extraordinarily slow because there's only edge. But um, so it, it depends on where you are, and that's kind of that's that's something that we need to bear in mind in uh, the design of what we do. And how and where we consume the web is changing as well. As designers and developers, we need to evolve to, to meet these challenges. Uh, we time shift content to read it later. So we use Instapaper or Readability, for example. Or we present content, content in environments that are less distracting, where advertising has been masked, like the Safari's Reader, or, for example. And we need to consider these changes in our markup and design. So we might start reading something at home on a computer, or maybe at work, because we can't afford one at home. Um, and then we might shift that content to our phone to read later while we're waiting for the bus that Nicholas mentioned. That bus, that, yeah, that bus. And then we might pick it up when we get home on a tablet. And then we may even print it out to give to our granny because she doesn't have a, she doesn't know what a computer is um, and she doesn't have one. Um, so we need to think about how we mark up our content for all of these different devices because that's where it's being consumed. So how do we confront this? And the challenges that we've seen, they're not inconsiderable. So at the core, what we need to think about is creating a sustainable web uh, with content that has longevity. And our kind of recipe for how to kind of make that happen is a thoughtful combination of beautifully crafted markup coupled with classic design principles, and that's what we'd like to call the secret formula. TM. TM. It's been around for some time, the secret formula. Um, it's available by looking back at our history in, in much the same way that Tom Standage mentioned yesterday. The secret formula isn't about sprinkles, although sprinkles used judiciously, that's a really hard word to say, judiciously, judiciously yeah, um, are a part of the equation. Um, great design is not about sprinkling from the top, it's about building from the bottom up. But we believe you can use sprinkles as well. So when you, we kind of think about design, all too often we're kind of looking at superficial elements and we're looking at sort of CSS galleries and uh, seeing that these are the latest kind of trends that we should be uh, employing, the, deploying in our designs. But usually they're kind of relied on as a crutch and the sort of the sprinkles become the fundament of what we're doing. And what we should be doing is we should be thinking of these sprinkles as kind of icing on the cake. And um, they're not the cake itself. And we'll show in a minute how we, can, we think we can bake a better cake. But first, we'll have a look, a look at some sprinkles. So we take a simple button, for example, a basic CSS box with some text and try and improve it. We might soften it up by adding a little border radius. 
we might add a little noise, which gives a sense of the real world. And if you haven't read anything by Mike Rundle, Philosophy, go and take a look at, at Philosophy on Twitter. Um, he's got a really great post about how we can learn from how light interacts in the real world, and, and we can use that in our design. Um, we could add a gradient to give a sense of depth. The highlight, love highlights. There's a little text shadow to make Hard it kind to of... Hard to see on that screen. Oh, it's okay. I can see it from here. It's good. And we might also introduce some kind of transition or something when maybe somebody use, a user interacts with that, um, giving them feedback. So the end result is that you got a button that's got a little bit more depth and it's you know, a little bit of a richer experience than uh, the one at the top. Um, and is it better designed? It's more satisfying to click on and all that kind of stuff, of course, it is. And the rounded corner and the noise and the gradient and the text shadow and the transitions, they kind of add up to that little extra something that kind of shows that you care about your design. But there's fundamental principles that must come before this. And this kind this of design really principle uh, it is kind of like that's the sprinkles on top. We so, believe that web design for the web, uh, great design for the web goes great, uh, a lot deeper. It's about building from the ground up, baking this cake the right way, and then adding that sprinkle stuff that we just ran through at the end, um, and not running through it the other way around. So we believe in hierarchy, uh, getting a good information hierarchy, composition, thinking about how we lay out a page and how that might change in different contexts. Typography, where we can use much more in the way of typography now on the web, thanks to Typekit and uh, font deck and services like that. Semantics, stuff that was back in 1990. Uh, device independence, thinking about not, not designing for one specific context, but designing for lots of contexts. And then openness, uh, designing something that's non-proprietary. So here's an example of hierarchy. And we can use a number of factors to determine uh, kind of the, the, the relative hierarchy of the elements on the page. Size, weight, and position. Uh, will help to establish a visual hierarchy that can inform the design in a really timeless manner. So it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't have to be kind of rocket science. It's really quite simple stuff if you just know the rules and, and deploy them. Uh, there's also, we're going to look at shortly, you can use color as well in uh, establishing the hierarchy of the page. We can also learn about composition. Uh, we can learn from the history of the printed page, uh, as we'll show shortly. Yes, the web is different, and as we've seen, it is very malleable. But the best grid systems deal with ratios and systems, and those ratios and systems can be applied in a, in a non-fixed environment. Um, a solid grounding in grid systems can be learned from the world of print, we believe, and applied to the web. You only need to look at Mark Bolton, for example, to see uh, a designer who's really, really using grid systems effectively. And typography is another kind of real uh, learn about typography, learn the basics, and learn kind of, well, just, just read about typography and find out um, what are the kind of classic secrets that have been deployed for, you know, the, the last couple of hundred years. And there's a lot of stuff that we can just directly take and use on the web. And now with the sort of, with the services that allow you to use more than the kind of core web fonts, there's, uh, it's all the more important to uh, keep the kind of typographic rules in mind when you're putting this stuff on your pages. So those are three elements that we believe are fundamentals from the design side of the equation. But we also feel there are three elements from the markup side of the equation. There is semantics, obviously. There are semantics. Would it be there are semantics? I think so. Possibly. Yeah. There are semantics. Um, HTML5 offers us a number of new semantic elements that we can add further uh, meaning to our markup. Um, and by adding that new meaning, we can ensure our content is better read by both humans and machines. The device independence, we've touched on this before. Uh, with uh, mobile devices being kind of so widely used, um, we have started to realize that we really need to consider the device independence. But it was, in fact, a founding principle of the web. It was when it was first created to be able to run your pages on any platform, any device, was kind of one of the real founding principles. And we're kind of coming back, remembering that that was, that was always the case. 
And we're also really lucky working in this environment. I'm sure everybody here learned to do what they do by using view source. Um, we're in an open context when we design using HTML and CSS. Um, and we, that enables us to learn from others and to share and for us all to build collectively. Um, yes? None of this is new. Uh, in fact, all of this is old. Um, in design terms, the principles are fundamental principles going right back to sort of the days of Gutenberg and, and, and beyond. Or is beyond when it's in the past? The opposite of beyond. I thought you were saying he was called Beyond Gutenberg? But like yeah. Bjorn Born, the tennis player? Um, his name is not Bjorn, his name is Bjorn. Oh, sorry, he's Swedish. Yeah. Mr. So in markup Mr. Terms, Mr. Persian. markup terms, the principles all date back from about 1990 when Mr. Berners-Lee invented the WWW. So we're not going to take a look at the history that we can draw on to make our lives as designers and developers a little bit easier. So we'd like to present to you the iceberg metaphor. Uh, this is uh, also TM as well. Uh, don't be stealing that one. It's, that's worth money. So, all too often we're obsessed with what's either above the water or below the water. However, we need to be obsessed with both to create great designs that last. It's not just about markup, it's about design as well. And as true craftspeople for the web, we need to care about what's above the water and what's below the water. Markup and design have evolved and they continue to evolve. And by looking and learning from the past, we can pave the ways to the future. Now, we've taken liberties with gravity here on this next slide, and we also have a transition that we apologize for in advance. So our iceberg is not the classic 10% above the water and 90% below the water. It's, it's a 50-50 type of iceberg. Um, so we're going to look at this in two halves. We're going to look first at the under the water bit, and then we'll look at the above the water bit. We're so going to. Sorry. We're starting with the markup timeline. And we're going to try to bear in mind the three core themes from uh, a previous slide, semantics, device independence, and openness. So the markup layer is the bottom half of our 50-50 iceberg. And let's trademark that as well, 50-50 iceberg. 50-50 iceberg dot org. Okay. Com. It's human nature to see everything we do as being in the here and now. But markup has, in fact, evolved over time. Uh, though it has developed, it has, at a fundamental level, remained the same. So let's rewind 21 years. 13th of November, 1990 is the date. And let's take a look at the very first web page. And we'll see that, in essence, nothing has fundamentally changed over the last 21 years. And what we're looking at here is the very first web page. It might not look like much. But this simple page fundamentally changed everything. It was the realization of almost half a century's thought. In 1945, so this is a bit like Tom Standage, because we've got 1945 in, yeah. Vannevar Bush proposed Memex, a proto-hypertext memory index. In 1965, Ted Nelson coined the word hypertext. However, it wasn't until 1990 that Tim Berners-Lee came along and realized these visions and made this real. And it completely changed everybody in this room's lives, and also everybody around the world. So here we go. The, looking at this markup, you can see that it's pretty much, um, it's very much like the markup we see today. There's some uh, body and head elements missing. Um, there's some unquoted age prep um, yeah. stuff in there. But it looks pretty much, looks, looks like HTML5. It doesn't look completely different is the point. Um, and if we fast forward just 24 days, and it's a staggering amount of progress in 24 days, the web page we saw on the previous side had been expanded out to encompass a whole bunch more semantic meaning. Um, many of the elements that we know and love today were, were created back then. That's 21 years ago, and a lot of that hasn't changed. Uh, this markup still works even better. It's semantic, it's device independent, and it's open. Uh, it works on different operating systems, different platforms, different hardware, different software. And that was the purpose of the web, to connect people. So this is one of the fundamental principles of the web. And we think that's a big deal. So we're into competition time. And uh, because I'm from uh, North Belfast, I'm going to throw these uh, into the audience, be able to reach kind of the far end of the auditorium, I'm sure. 
Uh, can no, I you're get, crow. Can I get like a couple to throw? Okay, you can get a couple. It's fine. You, you get two, and I get three. So okay. okay. Right. Okay, so this is know your Chrome. So what we want you to do is we want you to shout out what browser we're looking at Here. This, this web page in. So what's this? Chrome, that's like 100 people. I'm just going to throw it out randomly. Yeah, just okay? throw it in. Of course, this is Chrome. This? Sorry, we gave that one really to you earlier. Okay. Did you throw a badge for that one? I didn't. Uh, Over there? These gentlemen down here. Um, Oops, sorry. This one? Firefox. There, there was you definitely, said Firefox? There was definitely somebody kind of there. Yeah. Oh, come, that's accuracy, wasn't it? Um, so, Firefox. This one? There's a big clue in that tab, really, isn't there? Does anybody say Opera? It's kind of better branding, subtle branding going on there. Nearly. And finally, this one. Awesome, yes. Fantastic. There's like a lot of people over there getting badges, start throwing them in that direction. Throw the book that way. Uh, that is links we know and love. So, by its very nature, the web was cross-browser, and it was also responsive. So if we scale a page down, it was responsive design. Uh, and we're talking a lot about responsive design now, partly because of people like Ethan Marcotte, but we've, we've actually been able to do responsive design for a while. So we're fast forwarding to the year 2000. And we had Tim Berners-Lee in 1990, and uh, we're going to take Mr. Selman to represent kind of what was happening around 10 years later, about 2000. Uh, Selman, as you, uh, as you all know, uh, started the Web Standards Project and he kind of realigned things, and it was taking things back to where they were always kind of meant to be, uh, moving away from proprietary markup towards non-proprietary open standards. Uh, so he led the Web Standards Project between 1999 and 2002. And I think this is our, is this our book competition? Book I think prize. we have a book prize coming up. Anybody who can name the person who was leading the Web Standards Project right before Mr. Seldman, 1998. I don't think anyone's going to know that off the top of their head. But they all they? have computers. Come on, it's going to be like who? No, no. No. Nope. Fred, yeah, John. Fred, Jimmy. You, say, you Jimmy. said George? You said George. It's, uh, it's actually George Olson, 1998. Come and get the book. <laughs> Round of applause. And uh, we signed it as well, so it's going to be worth money. That was basically Thanks. cheating, though, because you just ran through a whole bunch of names. This is the best way. So, Mr. Zelman got us back on track because of things like this. Uh, remember, isn't it great? We, we love animated GIFs. This, um, this is basically the web as it was in the late 90s. If you remember what it looked like and what it felt like, it felt like this dancing baby. Um, I think if I did a bit of that, I might lose a bit of weight. Yeah, you're wearing the same underwear as well. Um, we kind of got a little bit distracted because what happened was that browser makers started to kind of make more and more features available, and it was a kind of a rapidly evolving landscape. Uh, and we kind of forgot about using the markup the way it was intended. And uh, tables were starting to be used for layout purposes, which was never kind of intended. So everything just kind of became a little bit hacky. And what Selman was trying to do, and kind of the cohort, uh, was to bring things back towards the semantics. What was that? Stop the baby. Stop. Oh, sorry. We'll move the baby. <laughs> People are like having uh, epileptic fits and stuff like that. Sorry about that. Oh, sorry, apologies to any epileptics in the audience. Um, so, what the WASP promoted, which Mr. Zeldman, as we said before, led, was a return to markup as it was always intended. Goodbye markup abuse, hello again semantics, using elements for what they were intended. Uh, and the Web Standards Project evolved to lobby for HTML4, XML1, CSS1 and 2, um, and officially recognized DOM and non-proprietary JavaScript. But what was really important about this time as well was that people started to come together as a team um, and try and help each other out. So we have sites like Blue Robot. So the community was starting to kind of pull together and kind of get, basically create resources for each other so that we could all start making kind of our own personal 
blogs or sites using this newfangled technology, CSS for presentation, HTML for, uh, for content. And uh, there was kind of a real sort of um, growth of these kind of like small-ish sites using this kind of this, this new better way of doing things. But it was still kind of, it was just a sort of, you know, it was web designers doing it kind of to show their friends how, how cool they were. It's a little bit like HTML5, really. Um, in October 2002, however, uh, a real tipping point when under D Douglas Bowman, Wired redesigned using CSS and XHTML1. And if a high traffic website like Wired could do it, then what was stopping the rest of us from ad adopting this new standards based approach? And we're going to read out a little bit of a longish quote here from Douglas Bowman because it's kind of interesting to hear uh, how this resonates today. They while, say, while you read that quote, I'm just going to. You're going to drink some water. Just have a drink. Cool. Go for it. By converting to the hybrid markup language XHTML and adopting cascading style sheets, Wired News is now faster to load and can be read by practically every version of every web browser. It can be displayed on a wider range of browser platforms, including mobile phones, PDAs, and televisions. So it's basically exactly what we were talking about with device independence, openness, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so it's kind of, it's just been evolving from 1990, 2000 until today. When Dave Shea launched the CSS Zen Garden in 2003, he then started to show all of us the possibilities of what could be done when we truly separated content and presentation. And what was interesting, I think, before we click the next slide because they fade through, about this time was the number of people who all were contributing to something, and there was a sense of community. So we have Dave Shea designing something. We have uh, Andy Clark, um, John Tan, Dan Rubin, and Douglas Bowman, who we showed you the uh, Wired site earlier. So this is just a handful of examples of designers and developers who are kind of trying to move the web forward. And I'm going to move fast forward. Fast forward another 10 years, 11 years even. Um, CSS based layouts and the separation of content and style and behavior is accepted practice. That's what we do now, and it's a natural thing. And uh, the initiative instigated by WASP and others have kind of essentially won, and structure, presentation, and behavior uh, is now kind of, that's, that's our focus, that's how we do things, and so we all know we're all ruled over by the overlord, Mr. Chairman Hickson. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman Hickson, yeah. Mr. Chairman his Hickson. Name, Chairman. If you draw a line from 1990 to today, however, there is a clear evolution. What HTML5 does is evolve our markup layer and enhance it for the future. It offers a richer semantic vocabulary, including new elements which allow us as designers and developers to leverage our content in much more exciting ways. And uh, the W3C also has kind of uh, identified HTML5 as the one true path moving forward. And even more excitingly, there's a fancy logo. Um, but it, it's not just a fancy new superhero badge. HTML5 offers us new... Holy HTML5 logo. Batman. Uh, new semantics, amongst other aspects, which allow us to create device-independent open markup that lasts. It's about semantics. We, we talk a lot about this when, we, when we're teaching, uh, that HTML is a design element. You know, we're, we're doing some design when we've done that phase. We're not doing design once we've done, once we do get into the CSS side of things. Um, we are, but, but HTML is also a big part of that as well. And we need to read everything first and look for meaning. And we can use HTML5's new semantic elements to add more meaning to the markup that we create. So we have a bunch of these new elements which allow us to do exciting things and make markup that works better for both humans and machines. And going back to the quote, which I'm sure you remember, because it was only like a couple of minutes ago, the thing that Douglas Bowman was saying in 2000 about uh, faster to load, being read by practically every version of every web browser, displayed on a wide range of devices, and also kind of, you know, it's uh, been able to, um, not just kind of humans, but also computers will have a better understanding of the markup that we're producing. So, it's been an evolution. If we return to this timeline and we look at the start and the finish, we'll see that markup is evolving, and this is on a continuum. 
and we can learn from points on that continuum. So if we take two points on the continuum, there's the web page 24 days after Mr. Berners-Lee, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, I think. Mm -hmm. Lord Berners-Lee? King Berners-Lee? Maybe, I don't invented know. Invented the interwebs. Um, and this was responsive design. And then if we look, fast forward to 2001, and Simon Collison's uh, recently relaunched personal site, which we'll show later, this is also responsive design. So actually, though a lot has changed, a lot has remained the same. And we can learn by looking back to, to the past. So we're going to move over to the design timeline. And the three themes that we're bearing in mind now is hierarchy, composition, and typography. And I think we've got a 50-50 iceberg coming up as well. So we do. let's look at the design layer. And again, we take a timeline here. And we look to the past and see how things have evolved and changed. If we go back to 1928, uh, designer Jan Schischkold, uh, an undisputed master of typography, uh, published a book called Die Neue Typography. Sorry to the Germans in the audience, because that probably sounds really, really bad. Um, his work emphasized a clean and systematic approach to design. Um, and his emphasis on systems and how we build systems for content can still inform what we do today. So the design, which is really kind of off the time, it's bold and it's beautiful, um, minimal design, really striking. And it exists kind of outside of time. And it really isn't sort of about the kind of 1% noise trends. It's about longe longevity. And uh, looking at this, you can't really sort of place it in 1920, 1940, 1970. Um, and his style, which is a really rigorous, systematic approach, has proven hugely influential for designers for almost a century. And we can still learn from looking at the principles behind this. And I think also reducing the palette as well, actually, because the next slide has two colors, but this really only has one, because the yellow is a ground. Um, you know, this is really powerful time, standing the test of time design. Just black, red, and some judicious use of composition. Um, and this has a sense of uh, timelessness. And also, that guy has a really great mustache as well. So we had to put that slide in. Because um, look, he also has, has a great mustache. Oh, please remove the video. Oh, can you guys do that? Can we get the video off? Because somebody wants to take a photograph and get the whole mustache. thing in <laughs> with the mustache. Yeah, look at that. Can, we, can you get a badge thrown all the way up there? Um, we get, so we get if we take later. a look at this, um, we're looking at things like the golden section and fundamental uh, composition principles, limited palettes, uh, simple, clean typography. And these designs exist outside of time. Or if we look at this A4 letterhead and these instructions that Chishkold has drawn up for how to lay that out, you know, it doesn't look dissimilar to a web page. Um, and we can learn from the systems and the rational approach. So what's really worth emphasizing there is the rational systems that are kind of the underlying core of the design. And even if we're not kind of doing a visual design of a page, thinking about those systems is really kind of a good lesson to learn in anything that we do. So if we fast forward 30 years, uh, we reach the emergence of the Swiss international style. And a huge figure in that is Joseph Muller Brockman, um, pioneer of his craft. He was born in 1914 and studied architecture, design, and history of art, which I think is a really interesting mix. Um, and even after his death in 1996, his legacy still lives on and influences people today. And what we can learn from this is systems, systems, systems. This uh, is emphasizing the underlying grids. And it's a really well-chosen palette of color and type. And it's minimal, but really quite rich at the same time. And if we look at like a collage of posters together, these all have a timeless quality. Um, and they might have been made 50 years ago, but they still feel fresh and new today. Um, and we can learn a lot from looking at this. Uh, Hierarchy, composition, and typography being the sort of the underlying core essence. Does anybody have this book? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, no more. You can 
It's your personal badge. I'm going to have to take my personal badge off and give it to you. There you go. Okay. Keep going. So, Keep uh, going, young man. It's required reading. It's a really good book. And it's really systems focused. And it offers an insight into the signs of grid systems. And it's something that we can just take and learn from and apply straight to the web. It's about, I think, 40 quid. But it is a book that you just keep coming back to. It's just full of so much really good advice. Um, and he really is a master of the grid system. And we can learn from this, as we see in the, in the next set of slides, and apply this type of thinking, this systematic approach to the web. So if we fast forward 58 to 2011, that's what? It's a bunch of years. 50 years, many years. Koi, Koi Vin, uh, whose book we showed in the, in the first few slides, uh, he, in many, w many ways, ties together an understanding of both markup uh, and, and design, and especially grid systems. Um, together with Mark Bolton, uh, who's another kind of real strong kind of grid systems kind of designer, he's been making a compelling case for the kind of rediscovery of grids and how they might, might be applied to the web. If we look at the New York Times website, which was redesigned by Koi Vin in 2006, and he is also at pains to stress that this was not his redesign, he, he led the team and it was actually a group of people who put this together. It is underlined, underlying this is a solid grid system. And this is five years old, and it still looks fresh and contemporary today, but, but it also is a, a high traffic site with a lot of content going through it, and content that you can't always predict because it's the news. Um. So there's a, this is Koivin's personal site, and uh, it's got a timeless quality. Um, it's kind of moving beyond the sort of redesign the portfolio site every year mentality and sort of just going for what is kind of trendy and popular at the moment and uh, goes back to something which is much more fundamental. And it also, you know, he's not afraid to show you the grid that it is based upon. Um, just black and white and then just an accent color of orange for, for when you interact with certain uh, parts. The best thing about Koi Vin, though, I think, is that he built a website for his dog. I think that's nice. So the book, Ordering Disorder, is well worth getting. And it's kind of a, a primer on how grid systems can be built and uh, be, be built into the design process when we're designing for the web. So, very good book. Yeah, d get it. We're, we're not getting paid by any of these people or anything like that. Maybe we should. It sounds like we're a bit advertising. Maybe we should. We should have like an advertising. We walk on with boards and stuff. Yeah. New next, revenue next stream. Time. Yeah. So if we come back to the timeline again, and we look at 1950 and 2011. And in 1950, we have a piece of work by uh, Joseph Muller Brockman. And in 2011, we have a detail of a blog post on the Typekit blog by Frank Camero on hierarchy in, in web typography. And if we look at these, this piece from 1950 by uh, Joseph Muller Brockman, there's a clear hierarchy in terms of the type uh, and the information hierarchy in terms of how that's marked up. And we can almost look at that and see markup there uh, behind the scenes. And then if we fast forward 61 years, we have Frank Camero on the Typekit blog. And what's interesting I think about this is a lot of people kind of go, wow, my god, Frank Camero, this is just awesome. And it's kind of old. A lot of it's really old. So we could kind of go back and look to the past, and we could learn a lot ourselves. If we look at those two side by side, we see that they are, they're not really that different. OK? Yeah. So let's try to put these two halves of the equation together. And by marrying fundamental web standards with timeless design principles, we can create beautifully designed user experiences that embrace the full range of emerging technologies at our disposal. Yeah, but you didn't say ebony and ivory. I did not say ebony and ivory. It's like ebony and ivory. Working together in perfect harmony. <laughs> it's like keyboard Could you not piano. sing that? Yeah. Key by key. Why don't we? I don't know the rest. 
<laughs> I, I, that's, I don't know the rest either. So, so we go back to the 50-50 uh, the, the iceberg again, and we start to look at these two things put together, which is a solid fundamental layer of good, good quality, considered beautifully crafted markup, and then a design layer that considers typography, hierarchy, composition, and the fundamental things that we've just run through. We can see examples of sites that put these things together that have a timeless quality and are beautifully designed. So we, we're looking at hierarchy, composition, typography, semantics, thinking about device independence, thinking about the context in which people will be seeing things and starting to realize that they won't be seeing them in the same context all the time and that sometimes the same person might be looking at the same piece of context content in a variety of contexts. So in 1990, what we didn't have was the presentation layer. The HTML was kind of just there raw. And, uh, but you still had pages that worked everywhere and that were kind of with independent, device independent, and so forth. And what we've been able to do in the last kind of 20 years is approaching uh, a vision of how the web was meant to be. But it's now looking great as well which is kind of a good thing. And one last one on that list is openness as well. Um, so if we take a look at Mark Bolton's site for five simple steps, uh, we can see some of the things that we talked about uh, earlier on. We have a solid information hierarchy in terms of the way this information is presented. Uh, and then th there's, there's, there's even a system in terms of how those book covers are designed. So every cover gets its own color and is always in a different typeface and it's always set at the same point uh, in terms of composition, except for Andy Clark, who wants his own cover. I, I feel pain about that, Nicholas less so. Um, we were gonna do a wraparound that was just purple with type and then distribute it free on the web, but we didn't really wanna piss off Andy too much. So, uh, is another Andy we can't piss off? Yeah, well, let's not do I'll, I'll just stop right there. Kyle Mayer uh, has uh, done some excellent work for this year's Build Conference, and uh, it's a really great web conference in Belfast. You should all go to it. It's sold out, but maybe next year. Uh, and it combines a restrained color palette with bold, elegant typography, and has got that sort of timeless quality. And it's really kind of using very simple, subtle methods to kind of convey the hierarchy of information and um, I, think, I think another thing to point out about this, and we don't actually have this as a slide, but it's probably worth uh, talking about just for a second, um, is that designing within, a, within tight restraints like this doesn't mean to say we can't have fun. We can't make things enjoyable and pleasurable. Has anybody seen this site? Like hands? One person. The front, the front page, have you seen the front page? With the videos? It's really, really nicely done, where, where, where what they did was they asked the speakers to uh, shoot videos of themselves and then they presented them in black and white using HTML5's video element um, and they have them all there so they look like these static pictures of Josh Brewer but they're in fact people just kind of s sort of doing this and you were asked to because we were speaking at this you were asked just to kind of stand that's him standing still uh, we can do it I was going <coughs> like that. that was not having a heart attack that was laughing um, but it, it's, it's a really nice idea because it works within the context of a very simple, rational, clean design. But it's quite playful and it's quite exciting. Uh, this is a good site, great resource for inspiration, aisle one. Um, and it's... Antonio Carasone. Thank you. I Thank think you. is how you, uh, it's, that, that's who it is. I'm just not sure how you pronounce that. So apologies to anyone who's Spanish or something, or Portuguese, sorry. Uh, we got that wrong, possibly. Um, and if you click on this little green thing in the top corner, this dashboard slides out, which is really beautiful. And there's a lovely user experience as that kind of slides in. And again, we see evidence of a so solid underlying grid system, a restrained use of color, um, and a strong hy uh, t hierarchy in terms of the type and the information and how things are marked up. And because this is kind of a, this is a blog about design, it's really interesting to see the really kind of strong ties with the work from the 1970s featured on this page uh, and the design of the site itself. And you can sort of see how the parallels are really clearly there. And it's all about the hierarchy and it's all about typography and it's about kind of restraint as well. It's a great blog, aisle1.com, I think. Um, 
And he also, I don't know when this guy does any work actually, because he's just doing this all the time, I think. Uh, he also set up a website called The Grid System, which is fantastic, and it gathers together resources about grid systems, uh, books you should read, web articles, things like that. And you can toggle the grid on and off. And what's really nice about this is it's not just the vertical grid that's been considered, but it's also the horizontal baseline grid as well. Uh, IA Information Architects, uh, which is a bunch of guys from Japan, or is it just one guy? I'm never sh quite sure. But uh, no, Mr. Richtenstein, apologies to the Swiss people, um, is from Switzerland. But and then the rest of them are from Japan. Oh yes, that's, apologies that's to the Japanese people. We haven't done any Japanese names. But this is a really beautiful site. It's uh, built on a solid layer of HTML5 markup. Um, and using all of the new elements at our disposal. Uh, and it's also responsive, so that as you view it in different types of devices, it uh, changes. And the content reformats itself to present itself to a way that is more amenable to the context in which you're looking at it. So as we said, under the hood, the markup is really well crafted as well. and. Uh, Semantic, using all the kind of new uh, HTML5 elements at our disposal. So it doesn't just look right, nice on the surface, but Don't you just well. wet your pants a little when you see beautifully crafted markup like that? You kind of go, oh, you know? So Maybe um, we do this too much. Maybe, maybe <laughs> we just wet our pants too much. Um, That's why I'm wearing those pants that the baby was wearing. It's a so, nappy, actually. Yes. I'm not wearing a nappy. Oversharing. <laughs> Naomi Atkinson recently. Yeah. Uh, Tom Standish talked about that yesterday. He did, didn't he? Yeah. Sharing. Uh, she recently launched uh, her portfolio sites, responsive, built in HTML5. And the example here is just showing how you can use kind of uh, an asset that you have on the page and display it in kind of various ways depending on the device width and so forth. So those are actually the same images, just kind of like removed and scaled. Uh, for something like an iPhone, or whatever, and or a Droid, or or a Droid, or a Zune. Or if you Zoom. have a Zune with web access, I don't know if. Yeah. Um, if we take a look at Simon Collison's recently redesigned personal site as well, um, it combines responsive markup with timeless design principles, and it, it has a functional, long-lasting, la sustainable type of, of web presence. And I think what's interesting about this is that you can look at the Muller Brockman and the Jan Shishkold and the Koi Vin and think that they don't get out much and go partying because they only look at sans serif typefaces and look at line heights and things like that. And, and you can see that and think, w w do we need to be constrained by this very modernist, very kind of uh, uh, post-war um, type of design style? And you don't. You know, This has got a very kind of Victorian type of flavor to it. Uh, so we can still use grid systems in an intelligent way, but in a design style that is slightly different. And again, this is responsive. So if we look at this perhaps on a tablet, uh, it, it reconfigures itself. And then if we look at it on a, a phone of some device, uh, some device. Description. Some description, that was the word I was looking for. Again. So functional and uh, a real functional site, but also a site with long longevity. Uh, here's another example, uh, Cognition, which is uh, Happy Cog's blog, so we're back to uh, Mr. Seldman. Uh, again, or as we like to call him, We Jimmy's Elders. That's another name for him, yes. Um, we got responsive design here, and it's also kind of an example of showing the type of content that you need to show for the specific for the specific device. If you're kind of looking at it on your phone, maybe that illustration of the graveyard uh, just becomes unnecessary. So just don't show it. And also a beautifully designed piece, uh, piece of work as well with a very restrained color palette again, you know, and showing what you can do. And also beautiful web typography and all of the things that we've been talking about. So what did we cover? Um, we started by surveying the landscape and looking at how the landscape that we design for now as, as web designers and web developers has changed considerably. Um, when we started doing this as a job, it was, it was perhaps easier, but the pace of change moves on. And we need to consider things like the range of devices that a, a user might be accessing our content on, um, knowing especially that the mobile web is growing considerably. 
and considering how we uh, deliver content that's appropriate to those kinds of scenarios. And we need to think about the scenarios in which people consume content. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows Kenneth Bowles. He's the guy with a really unpronounceable first name, spelled C-E-N-N-Y-D-D -D or something. This is good, because now I can apologize Called to anybody Kenneth. from Wales. And he did a great talk for us in Belfast for our students, where he talked about uh, desktop static type content, what he called desktop static content, which is where you maybe sit down and spend a lot of time reading something, so you want something that's in depth. And other types of content, which are more mobile, where you're standing in that bus queue waiting for the bus, and you maybe want less of the content, um, because you just want to kind of quickly flick through things and thinking about ways in which you might show or hide certain things or change the, 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 the way that the amount of content that people consume. And then we looked at the, the ways in which um, we can move from the desktop through to say the phone through to say the tablet through to say the paper for our granny. So the secret formula, uh, I hope you all wrote it down and uh, it's okay, you can, you can share it with people. We're not going to see you even though we have a TM there. Um, the secret formula being classic design principles and the fundamental founding principles of the web is keeping those in mind and making sure that we are designing uh, pages that are that are you're lost for words this? pages that that stand the test of time, that aren't just in the now, but also have a real kind of uh, underlying adherence to the core principles of the web. So we looked at things like hierarchy, composition, typography, semantics, device independence, openness. And if we make a mix of all of those things and we look back to the past and, and really look back at our history and look at what we can learn from that and transport into the, into the 2011, into, into the 2011, 2011. Uh, we can bring a lot to our design and make it more sustainable that lasts forward into 2022 um, and hopefully beyond as well. So the markup and design timelines uh, show this in practice and uh, amounted to what we'd like to call a marriage made in heaven. And I think that's probably uh, the right time to pull up our slide that says any questions. I think we're going to have uh, somebody coming out on stage. Enter left. So There questions. we go. Look at that. Um, and thank you as well for listening. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, there have been a few uh, tweeted questions, um, and I just want to start with one. It's typography related. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people have been asking for some practical sort of ways of applying some of the stuff you've been talking about. Um, so, particularly when it comes to typography, I was sort of thinking, you know, are there ways that we can actually apply? These principles, like you know, a mix of serif fonts and non-serif fonts between headings and body text, um, minimum steps in sizes between headings and body, weights, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'll you know. take that one. Yeah. Um, I think you could take a look at Tim Brown. I don't know if anybody knows Tim Brown. He's the type uh, manager for Typekit, um, and not just he, before he set, uh, took that role on, he was doing NiceWebType.com, um, and very in the, very much in the spirit of the openness thing designing beautifully crafted pages using rich web typography and then explaining how on earth he had done that. Um, and he, he, they're very, he's taken that passion, which he had in his personal blog, through to Typekit, where they're really heavily involved in getting designers out there, to, and developers as well, obviously, to, to look at some of the technical issues and to look at some of the design issues. And they have written fantastic posts on things like type pairing, or which typeface goes with another typeface, and general principles for that. And Tim also spoke at Build Conference last year um, about a, t a, co a typographic hierarchy tool he's been building, which is based on the golden ratio. Um, and he has a website, I can't remember off the top of my head, but if you send us a tweet, which is why that slide is better, um, if you send us a tweet, we'll dig it out and we'll send you a link. It's, it's well worth reading. Um, thank you. Um, can you just, just mention his name once more for everyone? Tim Brown. Okay. I don't need to apologize, because that's an English name, and it's really easy to say. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, also, someone asked, what was the grid book that you suggested? Uh, Joseph Muller-Brockman. It's, it's just called Grid Systems. 
uh, and then raster system in German. Sorry, German people. Great. Thank you. And um, it's really, it's, I, I think my, I, bought, I bought mine for about 60 quid or something, and I kind of felt real pain when I gave that credit card over um, in Tate Modern. And it's now only about 40 quid, and it's, it's just, you know, it's worth its weight in gold. Um, uh, what are your feelings on the move away from kind of stricter markup requirements from stuff like strict HTML um, versus, you know, HTML5? Could this actually cause less adherence to um, the standards, bearing in mind HTML5 is known to be a bit looser and more yeah. relaxed? I think that uh, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, question. It's something that we've kind of been uh, grappling with uh, when we teach our kind of uh, first and second year students who are all aspiring web designers, uh, when you had the kind of the strictness of XHTML, you could just say, no, you're doing that wrong, you need to do it this way. With HTML5, it's okay to do it this way, but it's also okay to do it a little bit looser and so forth. Um, when you're an established uh, designer, developer, uh, and you have kind of started writing your stuff in XHTML, then the natural progress is to keep on writing it that way and you just change the doc type and you kind of add the extra semantic elements and uh, that's kind of the natural way to go but when you start out and when you haven't actually done any markup before it becomes a little trickier personally I like the sort of this the kind of the strictness of the XHTML and I would kind of I would say to uh, any of the sort of students I would say that if you do it this way then it's much easier to figure out if something is going wrong if you kind of if you neglect to close your uh, tags and all that kind of stuff even though it's possible and even if it's valid it's not good practice so I would say that it's it's a little bit more of an open landscape and you have more options but what you decide to do at the end of the day uh, should be an informed choice and I think we're kind of also as a community reaching a maturity where where uh, where we can can be informed enough to make that choice and so personally, I would say, you know, I, I like the strictness, and I'm going to continue writing markup that way. Uh, and I would kind of, I, I would give that advice to people. As yeah, well. I think in the next edition of the book that we wrote, uh, which was really written for our students uh, to try and give them a solid set of guidelines to follow, and the they've asked us to write another edition in using HTML5 and some CSS3. And I think we would stick with the strictness because it's easier to teach. Um, I mean, I have a son who's 13. Who Not just, just easier to teach, but it's easier, well, it's easier to write. To, to, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's easier to author. But I have a son who's 13, and he's just finished the book over the summer because he thinks he's going to get paid loads of money as a web designer. I don't know where he got that idea from. Um, and, you know, it's easier to sit down and say, well, there's where, there's where that's gone wrong. And when you start to move towards looseness, it becomes harder to, yeah. to, to define that. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree, actually. Um, when it comes to sort of new devices, um, and there are new input mechanisms. Um, and also, you've been talking about grids. Now, grids obviously were, were started in order to fit a, a space that has physical bounds. Now, a screen doesn't really do that. Um, you know, you can use sliding mechanisms and, you know, styluses and all sorts of stuff. Um, and it doesn't really matter where you are on the screen. And I'm just interested, you know, how do you apply grids to a space that actually has unlimited borders in reality? I think you can still apply grids and have certain breakpoints at which you change your design to something that's more suited to the, the device that you're delivering it to. That doesn't mean that once you say go from here down to here, you just abandon grids altogether. You know, you think of a grid system that's appropriate to that particular device, and then you make another breakpoint perhaps for m smaller mobile devices. And again, you think of a grid system for that. I mean, that might be a one column grid. Um, but uh, the heart is, is understanding how that information is working as a, you know, in terms of contextually together. Um, the other thing is that your, your measures that not, does not necessarily have to be kind of you know, millimeters or pixel based. They can be kind of percentages or you know, M units. They can be uh, sort of, uh, there, there's, a, there, there's a, a, a kind of a scale and a relative kind of size uh, of the elements on the page. So the grid could still be there, but it doesn't have to be a fixed grid, so you can still apply the same principles, but, but use that in a fluid or in a responsive layout. Um, so. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you very much. Uh, thank you as well. Um, and talk to us over a beer afterwards, okay? Thank you. Thanks.
Thanks, guys.